We'd like to welcome you to the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin for tonight's Bible study. We are jumping back into the book of Exodus tonight, so I want to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with me to Exodus chapter 4. We'll be there in just a few moments. We're very glad that you've joined us. If you have any questions or concerns about class, if there's anything that we can do to help you in some way, if there's something we need to be praying about, either me personally praying for you or us as a congregation, we want to invite you to get in touch. You can call or text us at 608-224-0274. You can send an email to info at fourlakeschurch.org, or you can visit our website, fourlakeschurch.org, and go through the website to contact us in that way. And we'll put that information on the screen in just a few moments. And that'll stay there throughout our study tonight. You can also find us on social media by searching for Four Lakes Church. And while you're here, we also want to invite you to subscribe to the YouTube channel and turn on notifications so you can be reminded whenever we go live or add something new to the channel. But tonight we're back to the book of Exodus. And of course, we've taken a break from Exodus over the past several weeks. I was at Beaver Creek Bible Camp for a week at the end of June. And then we've been traveling for the past couple weeks. I believe it was just over 3,700 miles, passing through nine states. Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Virginia, North Carolina, and Maryland. So over the past couple weeks, we spent some time with my in-laws in Ohio. And we also got to check in with two of our former members living in North Carolina. It was a very good trip. And in my absence, we looked at the next few videos from Bible Lands Passages, created by John Moore, a friend of mine, a gospel preacher who preaches down in Texas. And I hope you were able to see those. We looked at the next several passages, but basically they tried to go to the Bible Lands and actually teach those lessons in the places where they actually happen. So if you have not looked into that, if you missed the class the past few weeks, I want to invite you to uh, get in touch and give. I'll give you the link. I can send it to you. You can look that up on your own. But since it's been a few weeks, I think we should probably just briefly review where we are right now. Of course, we studied Genesis for about a year, uh, taking roughly a chapter a week on a verse-by-verse -verse basis. And then just a month or so ago, we moved into the book of Exodus. And so we've got God's people moving down to Egypt for food during a famine. Thanks to Joseph, he was prepared. God uh, used Joseph to prepare the nation for the famine. And that's at the end of Genesis, maybe the last third, the last quarter of the book. And then we cross over into Exodus. And many years have passed, and there's a new pharaoh who steps on the scene. This is a man who does not appreciate what Joseph had done for the nation. And this new guy is really, really nervous. Of course, we learned a few weeks ago from Exodus chapter 1 that the Israelites are multiplying rapidly. And he's scared that they may team up with their enemies, but I think he was really worried that they might leave. The Egyptians had come to depend on the Israelites for labor. They were a key part of their labor force. And so Pharaoh appoints taskmasters over the Israelites, basically enslaving them. And we also found that Pharaoh orders the killing of all the male babies right as they are born. And one family, though, of course, covers a basket with pitch. They launch their son out among the reeds in the Nile River, where the child is then found by Pharaoh's daughter and is raised in Pharaoh's household. And, of course, this is Moses. And around the uh, age of 40, uh, he sees one of his countrymen, a Hebrew, being abused by an Egyptian taskmaster. And he strikes and he kills the Egyptian hiding his body in the sand. Well, he thinks he escapes any accountability for that, and yet word gets out, and he's on the run. Moses flees to the land of Midian as the Egyptians try to hunt him down, and over there in the land of Midian, he helps out some shepherd women, and he ends up being given one of these women as a wife. Well, when we came to Exodus 3 a few weeks ago, roughly 40 years had passed, so Moses is around 80 years old at this point, and he's a shepherd. He's tending sheep out there in the middle of nowhere. And he's actually near Horeb, the mountain of God, which is out there in the wilderness. And God appears to him through a burning bush, and that catches his attention. He can see that it's on fire, it's not being consumed, and so he walks over to it. And of course he has to take off his shoes because he's standing on holy ground. And the message is God has seen the affliction of his people, and he's ready to do something about it. In fact, he sends Moses, at least he needs Moses, to head back down to Egypt to go down to Pharaoh and to demand that Pharaoh let God's people go. Well, Moses immediately starts thinking of problems with this plan. No, this is a terrible idea, God, especially for me to do this. 
I'm just paraphrasing here, but that's the basic thought between these chapters that we're in right now. And so he comes up with a series of excuses, we might say, and he really he starts questioning who God is. And that's, that's his first issue. When I make these demands of Pharaoh, who do I tell him sent me? And we have God's answer over there in chapter 3, identifying himself as the I am. And God then lets Moses know that Pharaoh will not release his people willingly. He will have to be uh, compelled or forced by the Lord. But God also tells Moses to leave and to have the people ask their neighbors for all kinds of precious metals on their way out. And when they leave, this is how they'll be repaid for all of their years of slave labor. Well, this is pretty much where we left off a few weeks ago at the end of Exodus chapter 3. God wants Moses to go back to Egypt to talk to Pharaoh, to demand that he let God's people go. And Moses, his mind starts churning, and he's just thinking of, of any way that he can to get out of doing this. So let's jump back into it tonight, picking up with Exodus chapter 4, and we'll be looking at the first five verses. Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Then Moses said, What if they will not believe me, or listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. Then he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. But the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand and caught it and it became a staff in his hand that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Remember Moses' first objection back in chapter 3? It was basically to ask God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? So he's saying uh, that he's not qualified, that God had chosen the wrong guy for this job. And his next objection was that the people would want to know God's name, that, that God was unknown to the people. Now Moses comes to God with a third issue with this plan, a third objection, a third excuse. And he suggests that the people won't believe that he's really speaking on God's behalf. And I think we understand that. That's a very practical objection. If I go to somebody with a message from God, I think I have every right to say, well, how do I know that you're really speaking for God? Well, God, though, handles this objection just as he handled the first two. But this time God has a demonstration, doesn't he? He has Moses throw his staff on the ground, and the staff immediately turns into a serpent or a snake. Well, Moses, obviously, as a shepherd, he knows how this ends, and so he's terrified he runs away. But notice God then has him grab the snake by the tail. I don't know much about snakes, but I'm pretty sure you're really not supposed to grab a snake by the tail, are you? My understanding is right behind the head so they can't turn around and get you. I'm not positive about that. I'm just going to stay away from all of them just in case. But it's interesting that I think Moses probably would have known this. As a shepherd spending the last 40 years in the wilderness, the 40 years before that being highly educated by the Egyptians, you don't grab a snake by the tail. But God says, do it. Grab the snake. Grab that serpent by the tail. Well, it's interesting. The snake then turns back into a staff. And in my opinion, Moses most likely never looks at his staff the same way ever again over the next 40 years. As a shepherd, your staff would be with you at all times. You rely on it for, uh, you know, rescuing the sheep, for uh, fighting off predators, for leaning on, from keeping you from tripping in the rocks and so on. I think about hiking. Uh, for years, I used a staff, just a, a single stick. It was our son's old bow staff from karate. And when I went looking for a hiking stick and uh, he wasn't using that anymore, I'm thinking, this is it. It is a nice, smooth piece of wood. I planed down two side to side so it was a little easier to grasp on, put a little uh, ball tripod mount on the top so I could jam that thing in the dirt and have a monopod and take pictures and, and, and all of that. Uh, at camp, the kids uh, would call it my Moses stick. I think going back to this passage here, never turned into a snake, um, but I would use the single staff, the walking stick. Well, several years ago, I transitioned to trekking poles, and I told my sister about a hike I wanted to do out near her place a few years back, and she basically said, if you don't want to die on that trail, you will need to have trekking poles. And I said, well, I've got my Moses stick. And she said, nope, that's not going to do it. You need actual trekking poles. 
and uh, ran over, and I wasn't sure if I would really get into this or not, so I bought a cheap pair at Walmart for $19.95, uh, kind of the Walmart brand. I'm thinking if they don't work out, I can take them back about anywhere in the United States, and, uh, and sure enough, those trekking poles literally saved my life at least half a dozen times on that one hike alone. Uh, it was up the side of a mountain, there was gravel going off the cliff, and you could see the drop off a thousand feet on one side, and several times I slipped and those trekking poles caught me. Um, but I came to appreciate the trekking poles very quickly. But imagine, you're familiar with this piece of equipment. You've now used this for 40 years, and now imagine having your trekking pole that you bought at Walmart suddenly turn into a snake. You know what, every time I looked at that pole from that day forward, I'm thinking <laughs> that would always be in the back of my mind. This staff has the potential of turning into a snake at any given moment. And for Moses, I think that would be both terrifying and reassuring at the same time, ultimately knowing that God was always with him. Well, in this case, though, the main point behind this was that God would provide signs for uh, the purpose of convincing the people that Moses really was speaking on God's behalf. And when we think about it, I think we realize this is also the purpose of the miraculous signs in New Testament times, the miraculous gifts of the Spirit. The miraculous signs were intended to confirm God's message in those days before the scriptures were ever written down. And we know this from the opening verses of Hebrews chapter 2. The signs were given to confirm the word of God before it was written. But uh, here, God answers Moses' objection by providing proof and giving him the ability to do some amazing things. But wait, there is more. So let's continue on with the next paragraph here. Exodus chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. Exodus chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. The Lord furthermore said to him, Now put your hand into your bosom. So he put his hand into his bosom, and when he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous like snow. Then he said, put your hand into your bosom again. So he put his hand into his bosom again, and when he took it out of his bosom, behold, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. If they will not believe you or heed the witness of the first sign, they may believe the witness of the last sign. But if they will not believe even these two signs or heed what you say, then you shall take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground, and the water which you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. So not only does God give Moses the sign of the staff turning into a serpent, but he gives two more in this little paragraph, starting with this demonstration where Moses' hand is immediately covered in leprosy. And of course, in those days, leprosy was a death sentence. It spread throughout the body. It was highly contagious. And if you had leprosy, it was over. But it was a long, painful, drawn-out, awful way to die. Well, he comes out with this hand in advanced stages of leprosy, and then God tells him to put it back in, and it comes out and it's immediate, immediately cured. And that right there would have been an amazing thing. And I do find it interesting that Jesus also cured people of leprosy, didn't he? And so it seems then that we may have some foreshadowing going on here. In other words, when people saw Jesus cure people of leprosy, I think those with honest hearts would have thought back to Moses. And they would have realized that Jesus was indeed a prophet like Moses, that he had the same kind of power. And then the third sign God promises is that Moses will have the ability to pour out water from the Nile and that that water will turn into blood. The Nile River, of course, meant everything to the Egyptians, and God is about to demonstrate his, his dominance over all of the uh, false Egyptian gods. Well, Moses objects that the people won't believe him, and, and God therefore gives Moses some pretty powerful tools in his toolbox, enabling him to do what God is telling him to do. So let's continue with the next paragraph. This is Exodus 4, verses 10 through 13. Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in times past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf? or seeing, or blind. Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth, and teach you what you are to say. But he said, Please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will. As I see it, this is at least excuse number four 
And Moses' reasoning here is that he's not eloquent. He's not a good public speaker. What you're asking me to do is, is going to involve talking to some very powerful people, and, and I'm not a talker. Maybe he had some kind of speech impediment. He's, he's slow of speech, slow of tongue. Something was wrong. And, and as with many excuses for not doing what God has commanded, any objection, it, it's pretty much accusing God of making a mistake, isn't it? Aren't we saying when we say something like this, God, you have picked the wrong person? You have failed in your choosing of me because I am not able to do what you're asking me to do? So I find it fascinating that God then turns that around with a question, doesn't he? Who has made man's mouth? Who has made him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? And so God reminds Moses that when God calls his people to do something, he will also empower them to do what he is asking them to do. God never asked us to do what is truly impossible. God will take care of it. And all Moses needs to do is obey. He just needs to do it. He needs to walk up there. He needs to take the first step, and he needs to get this done. Well, notice down in verse 12, we come to what we might also uh, actually describe as excuse number five. But really, it's not an excuse as much as it is a demand. God, get somebody else to do this. He's kind of run out of rational excuses. He's got that list of four things, and God answers those one by one. And, and I think Moses sees where this is going, and, and his final response here is, Lord, no, I, get somebody else to do this. And uh, he really, really doesn't want to do it. So let's see how the Lord reacts to this. Let's continue on then with the next paragraph. This is Exodus 4, verses 14 through 17. Exodus 4, 14 through 17. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. And he said, Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. You are to speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I, even I, will be with your mouth and his mouth. And I will teach you what you are to do. Moreover, he shall speak for you to the people. And he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. You shall take in your hand this staff with which you will, shall perform the signs. Well, when Moses suggests that God go find somebody else to do this, the Lord gets angry, doesn't he? The anger of the Lord burned against Moses. And in his anger, God pretty much assigns Moses a spokesperson. He gives him an assistant, uh, someone to speak on his behalf. And I think we might wonder why God doesn't just get Aaron to do all of this. But God had chosen Moses. Moses is the one who was raised by Pharaoh's household. Moses is the guy, but he needs help. And so God assigns Aaron as his spokesperson. Moses will be the brains behind the operation, we might say. Aaron will be the one who does most of the speaking. Moses is to dictate. Aaron is to uh, communicate that to uh, whoever they need to communicate it to. And uh, Aaron will do the speaking. Uh, but above all, God will be with Moses' mouth and with Aaron's mouth. Moses and Aaron will say what God tells them to say, and God will teach them what to do. And I believe the word here, or some of the words here, may be similar to the word prophet. In other words, just as the prophets in the Bible were spokespeople for God, so also Aaron is to be a spokesperson for Moses, who in turn was also speaking for God. So a little bit of a chain of command here, we might say. Um, at the end here, God basically tells Moses, uh, pick up your staff and, and get to work. You need to go and get this done. So let's continue with uh, Exodus 4, verses 18, 19, and 20. Exodus 4, 18 through 20. Then Moses departed and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go, that I may return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see if they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt. For all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and mounted them on a donkey and returned to the land of Egypt. Moses also took the staff of God in his hand. Now Moses apparently relents. He agrees to God's plan, even reluctantly, uh, because he goes home. He asks his father-in-law for permission to head back to Egypt to check on his brethren to see if they're still alive. <laughs> Uh, that's a bit strange to me. I think it may indicate that Moses really isn't sure about all of this. He's obeying God, but he's got some serious doubts at this point. I also find it interesting. He doesn't really tell his father-in-law Jethro the whole truth, does he? He doesn't say, I'm going to go and I'm going to bring two to three million people back here with me. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't tell him that. 
uh, but he tells him enough that uh, he'll let him go and uh, check on his people. Um, it, it's kind of strange, too. If Moses is 80 years old, isn't it interesting he's asking his father-in-law for permission? Very respectful move there on his part. I'm about to take your daughter and uh, your grandchildren and, and head out, and it's kind of a, a dangerous mission here. So he brings Jethro in on this, at least giving him some of the information. Well, God, though, lets Moses know that those who are trying to take his life are now dead. If you remember, Moses had left Egypt 40 years earlier on the run after killing the Egyptian who was mistreating the Hebrew slave. Um, I, there's a lot to be said for outliving your enemies. Must be kind of nice being 80. <laughs> All your enemies have died. Um, they're no longer around. A lot could happen in the past 40 years, and it has. So Moses, therefore, loads his wife and his kids on a donkey. He heads back in the direction of Egypt, along with the staff of God in his hand. What a trip that must have been, at least uh, heading out. But we're not going to make it all the way quite yet. So let's continue then with Exodus 4, 21 through 23. Exodus 4, 21 through 23. The Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart, so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So I said to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. But you have refused to let him go. Behold, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Starting in verse 21, we have God's summary of what's going to happen over the next few months. Moses will do what God has commanded, but God will harden Pharaoh's heart, and Pharaoh will not let the people go as he's been commanded. Well, some have been pretty concerned with this idea that God will harden Pharaoh's heart. I mean, how is that fair? Telling the guy to do something, and you're hardening his heart so he doesn't do it, and then killing his firstborn over it just doesn't seem fair. But as we work through the next few chapters, I think we'll find that about half the time, the Bible says that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And about half the time, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. Ultimately, Pharaoh has freedom of choice. But it seems to me that God may know that choice beforehand. And so God seems to do some things along the way that will ultimately get Pharaoh to the point of making a firm decision against obeying the Lord. But that decision is ultimately Pharaoh's to make. God is not making the decision for him. I might almost compare it to a marriage where there's tension between a husband and a wife. The more she asks him to do something, the more he resists and the more he hardens his position, you need to mow the lawn. You need to mow the lawn. You better get out there. You better go mow the lawn. Better mow it. And over and over and over again, it's his choice to make, isn't it? But the more she harasses him about that, the more he may resist. <laughs> and he may even get to the point where he decides in his own mind, no matter what happens, there is no possible way that I will ever mow that lawn again under any circumstances. Does that make sense? He has hardened his heart. And even though mowing the lawn is something he can very freely choose to do, the more she gets on him for it, the more he digs into this position of never doing it. Well, as I've said many times, there's no such thing as a perfect illustration. And certainly this fits in that category. Uh, but I think it may uh, help explain a little uh, and, uh, as far as what's going on here. The decision is Pharaoh's to make. He can release God's people. He can keep them in slavery. But the more Moses presses him on it, the more he digs in and refuses. And I think we'll see this develop over the next several chapters. In the second half of this passage, God makes a comparison that I, I seem to have forgotten about. I know I've read this passage a number of times in my life. Um... I hesitate to give the spoiler. We've all seen the movie. We know how this ends. Um, but it'll get to the point where God kills every firstborn among the Egyptians. Sorry to break that to you. That It's coming. When it happens, it may seem somewhat random. You know, why that? Why kill the firstborn instead of something else? There are many things that God could have done. But here's the explanation. Israel is God's firstborn in the sense that Israel is very, very special to the Lord. And since Pharaoh is, in a sense, 
killing God's firstborn by keeping them enslaved in Egypt, God will do the same for him. And so this is where we're headed. There's about to be this huge showdown between God and Pharaoh, and it will end with God killing Pharaoh's firstborn. This is simply the explanation before the fact. So Moses is giving us a little preview here. All right, I want to warn you ahead of time that the next paragraph is really weird. The next paragraph is a strange one. All right, let's continue then with Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 through 26. Exodus 4, 24 through 26. Now it came about at the lodging place on the way that the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and threw it at Moses' feet. And she said, You are indeed a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. At that time, she said, You are a bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Did I not warn you this was a weird one? That's a strange paragraph right there, isn't it? And, and to me, it almost seems like we're missing something. It, it's as if we don't have all the information we need to make complete and total sense out of this. We have what we need to see what happens here and move on. But I really wish we knew a little bit more. And it starts in verse 24 with the Lord seeking to put somebody to death. And that right there, at least in the New American Standard, it is not clear. And it, it's not specifically stated who God wants to kill, but I think it's safe to assume that we're talking about Moses here, aren't we? It really seems that God is looking to kill Moses. Well, that's kind of random. Right here in the middle of this chapter, things are going so well. And he did give a bunch of excuses, but ultimately he relented. He's heading down to Egypt. He's obeyed. He's traveling with his staff and his wife and his two kids. Um... But, so why does God want to kill Moses? And I don't know. We're not given the exact reason. I think based on what comes next, it's probably safe to assume that it's because Moses hadn't yet circumcised at least one of his sons. Somehow it's related to circumcision. But we aren't told. We aren't given the answer to the question of why God wants to kill Moses. But when they stop along the way, somewhere between Midian and Egypt... Um, God seems to have some huge problem with Moses for some reason. And again, just based on the immediate context, it seems to be this circumcision issue that he hasn't yet circumcised one of his sons. Well, then in the middle of this, we've got Zipporah, Moses' wife, taking a flint, circumcising their son, and throwing their son's foreskin at Moses' feet. I don't know whether any of you married people ever get in arguments with each other here and there. But I would suggest that when foreskins start getting thrown around, that's when you know the argument is pretty serious. And again, I feel like I'm missing something here. I'm, I feel like there is something I don't know about this passage, but this is just me trying to read between the lines. It seems that Moses and Mrs. Moses have a pretty serious disagreement revolving around their son's circumcision. Circumcision, of course, was a sign of the covenant first made with Abraham. And um, and this was the sign that, that was to be passed down through the uh, generations of the Hebrew people. And either their son turns eight days old on this journey and he gets circumcised, or, and I think this second option is most likely, when Moses realizes that he's headed back to Egypt to lead God's people, he suddenly realizes that he should probably circumcise his son. Maybe he's put that off because there was no need out there in the middle of nowhere. Nobody would know. It's not worth the hassle. And so my understanding of this is as he's heading back to Egypt, he tells his, his wife, you know, we need to do this. This is, uh, I, I can't really lead the people if, if I'm not a good example to my own family, if I haven't done this uh, to my own son. And as I understand it, Mrs. Moses Zipporah maybe not too familiar with this procedure over there in Midian, she completely loses it over this. You want to do what to our son? You know, under no circumstances are you going to put him through that. But we have to, Moses, I'm sure, said. Okay, fine, if you've ever been in one of those conversations. And, and Zipporah, she is absolutely livid over this. And she whips out the flint and she does it herself and she flings the foreskin at Moses' feet and accuses him of being a bridegroom of blood to her. Now maybe I've read too much into this, maybe I've completely missed it here, 
but we do know that there is an argument over circumcision of their son. That we do know in this paragraph. And that's about all we know right here. But like I said, it's a rather uh, strange paragraph. Um, in terms of a, a practical application, I want to just suggest that Moses as a leader certainly has some tension at home. <laughs> is that not the, like the biggest you know, understatement <laughs> of the hour? Uh, Moses and Mrs. Moses are having some issues here. <laughs> there is an, an, an argument going on and you know, they do not have the perfect marriage, and, and yet he continues leading, even with this conflict back home. And by the way, although Zipporah starts out on this journey, it seems as if she turns back at this point. We aren't told that here, but I say this because of what we'll eventually get to in Exodus 18. Over in Exodus 18, once Moses returns to the area with the Israelites, his father-in-law shows up with Zipporah and the kids because Moses had sent her away previously. And we learn this in Exodus chapter 18, verse 2. So we don't know it now, but sometime later, we learn that Moses sent her away and sent her back home. So again, just piecing things together, it seems that this conflict is so huge, uh, the foreskin flinging is so intense, that uh, Moses and his wife at least temporarily split up over this. It seems that he sends her away at this point uh, over this disagreement, although thankfully they do eventually come back together. Uh, if you have another interpretation of this paragraph, I would love to hear it. Again, use that contact information on your screen. Let me know if you figured something out here that I've missed, uh, but certainly an uh, interesting and, and rather disturbing paragraph. So let's conclude tonight with Exodus 4, 27 through 31. Exodus 4, 27 through 31. Now the Lord said to Aaron, Go meet Moses in the wilderness. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him, and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He then performed the signs in the sight of the people, so the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshipped. After all the family drama from the previous paragraph, God now tells Aaron to go meet Moses in the wilderness. They meet, and Moses explains things to Aaron. He runs through everything that we've just discussed. Uh, they then meet the elders of Israel, and notice Aaron is the one who tells the elders what God had said to Moses. And we, so we see Aaron is serving as Moses' spokesman, just as God had directed. Well, Moses then performs the signs. The people believe, they understand that God is concerned about them, and that God has seen their affliction, and they bow low and worship. And this is their response. So I, I think I would kind of summarize this chapter, so far, so good. Uh, we're off to a pretty good start, a few bumps along the way, but we're heading in a good direction. Ultimately, Moses has obeyed, and he's heading toward Egypt, and he meets with the elders, and he's getting them on board, at least as of now. Well, this brings us to the end of Exodus 4. And with that, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I don't want to waste your time. I want to focus on the Word of God, covering about a chapter a week. That's what we've been doing for 23 years now. And uh, that's what we're continuing to do with Exodus. So I hope to see most of you this coming Lord's Day at 9.30. We're going to get back to our study of the one-chapter books in the Bible. I believe that we're headed for 2 John. Uh, Stuart is teaching this week and the next as we look at 2 John. And you may want to come prepared on Sunday by reading 2 John. It'll take you about two minutes to read an entire book of the Bible. You can't say that very often, but uh, two minutes probably to get through 2 John. And then we'll also come together at 10.30 as we continue our study of Hebrews. We're going to pick up with Hebrews 10 verses 19 through 25. One of my favorite passages in the book of Hebrews. And again, if you have any questions, any comments about tonight's class, if there's some way we can help, if there's something we need to be praying about, if there's some way we can encourage you, uh, we want, want to invite you to get in touch. The contact information should still be there on the screen. If you're joining us on the phone tonight, obviously you can't see that, so you can call or give a text 608-224-0274. And we would love to hear from you. As we close tonight, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, the God of Moses and Aaron, you are a God who sees. You see our strengths and you see our weaknesses. You see our willingness to obey, but you also see our insecurities. And we confess to you tonight that you know us better than we know ourselves. 
And we pray that you would use us in any way that you see fit, that you would help us along the way, and that you would give us the courage to obey, even when it's not easy, and even when we don't understand. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, who has saved us from our sins. We come to you in his name. Amen.